For the most part, the chemistry of cyclic ethers is exactly like the acyclic counterparts. All of this formation in the chemistry is basically the same, um, and it doesn't amount to much as we've seen. But there's one very important uh, exception uh, to that, uh, and that is the uh, molecules known as epoxides. Okay, so an epoxide, um, as you probably encountered at this point, um, is a three-membered ether, right? So three-membered ring with an oxygen in it, um, and that's a very special uh, type of cyclic ether, uh, which actually turns out to be um, quite reactive, actually. So we can do some very interesting and useful chemistry with epoxides. To understand this reactivity, um, it's useful to think about the bonding situation in this highly strained ring. So if we think about a normal um, oxygen um, in, in terms of its uh, bonding patterns, um, we know that there's two lone pairs coming off of the oxygen, and then we know that there's going to be uh, two sigma bonds, right? so that the other um, electrons from the oxygen are going to engage in, in two other bonds, so whether those are two um, carbons or, or hydrogens, what have you, um, let's just do uh, carbon substituents in this case. Right, so there's going to be uh, two sigma bonds that that occur there, right? So electron density between the carbon and oxygen, uh, and the uh, you know if we envision the uh, oxygen being sp3 hybridized, um, we know that the the angle um, here, right? So that angle we know wants to be approximately 109 degrees. Okay, and that's going to be optimal in order to get um, that uh, that good direct overlap between those two orbitals. But now if we consider um, a, an epoxide where the oxygen needs to make uh, bonds between two carbons, um, but those carbons are, are uh, you know, disposed in a three-membered ring, um, that actually turns out to not be um, so favorable. So we still have the two lone pairs coming off of the oxygen but remember that those, those other angles want to be 109 degrees. But what are the degrees of an equilateral triangle? Well, it's 60 degrees, right? So that's, how, how is it going to reconcile that? Um, and the way that it recon, reconciles that is uh, that it, it makes a very weak bond. So um, the, the angle that these two um, uh, lobes of these orbitals um, exist at um, is is not 60 because it simply just can't be 60. It's it's too much to get to that angle, um, and so it sort of compromises. So um, both the carbons and the and the oxygen um, sort of make a compromise, and the carbons do that as well, right? And they sort of do these these tilted um, types of of interactions. So these uh, two, two orbitals are no longer directly between the atoms, they're sort of pointed off uh, uh, at an angle to one another. Um, and that reduces the strength of that interaction. So that, that's not as much of a bonding interaction as you would get if the angle uh, was uh, where it wanted to be. And so that is basically what, what we call angle strain. So those bonds are much weaker than they would normally be um, if the um, if the interaction could still be um, where it wanted to be um, due to that uh, need for the 60 degree angle, okay? So these bonds here, um, if you sort of thought about the uh, electron density um, of, the, of where, where, where those electrons would exist, um, you know, you might consider it to kind of be bulging out um, to the sides of, of where the atoms are. And so it would kind of exist a little bit outside of the ring um, where the, those nuclei exist. And so for this reason, these are or have been historically sometimes referred to as banana bonds uh, because they're sort of these, these curved uh, bonding situations, right? So those electrons aren't, aren't as tightly held, and that's why we uh, see epoxides um, be, be really relatively quite reactive. Uh, so the ring strain ends up explaining a lot of the chemistry of epoxides. So first question is to remind ourselves, how can we make epoxides? So again, I think that you've probably seen 
um, the common methods, um, but we can talk about them again very briefly. So preparation of epoxides. So uh, one of the most powerful ways to do this is to epoxidize an alkene. So um, remember that the uh, reagent that is most common on a laboratory scale is something called MCPBA. And so this is metachloroperbenzoic acid, which has this structure, okay? And uh, we can uh, epoxidize alkenes uh, really of a, of a very broad uh, range of structures, okay? And all we have to do is just treat with MCPBA and what's very useful about um, this method is that uh, the reaction is stereospecific, which means that if you put in a trans uh, alkene, you're going to get the trans epoxide out. If you put in a cis alkene, you're going to get the cis epoxide out. Okay. Um, or if you have a tri-substituted alkene, uh, the relative orientation of those three substituents is going to translate to the product. And so um, that's a very useful aspect of this reagent. Um, so we can remind ourselves very quickly how MCPBA works. So we draw out our alkene, sort of a side on view. Okay. And what happens here is that the, the peroxy uh, bond of the um, of the MCPBA is going to orient um, perpendicular um, to the uh, the pi or sorry parallel to the pi system of the alkene, okay. And then if we just kind of draw in the rest of the structure, so we can have this internal hydrogen bond uh, between the the uh, the uh, proton of the per acid and the carbonyl oxygen. So it forms this nice five membered ring. And then here's the whole um, aromatic piece, which really isn't uh, involved in the in the mechanism. Okay, and so we, we got it. What we have is the pi system of the alkene uh, can basically do a, do a backside uh, attack on that oxygen oxygen bond. So uh, it displaces um, this portion from that oxygen, so we can push the electrons up, uh, push the electrons from the carbonyl over to grab the proton, and then these electrons are going to fill. So all of this is a concerted type of mechanism. We don't have to go through any charged intermediates. And uh, what we get at the end then is the formation of both carbon oxygen bonds at the same time. And then we also with the, uh, the per acid, uh, we end up just forming a carboxylic acid, again, without having to go through any charged intermediates. So it's all, all a concerted flow of electrons and that's how the oxygen is transferred, and that's why it's stereospecific, because both bonds are forming at the same time. There's no time for any rotation to happen uh, in which you could, you could actually scramble that stereochemistry, okay? So the addition of both carbon-oxygen bonds occurs um, in a syn fashion, so meaning from the same side um, of the double bond, okay? So MCPBA, very, very useful for forming epoxides. Um, and there's another way we can form epoxide um, which basically um, amounts to an intramolecular Williamson ether uh, formation, Williamson ether reaction. Okay, so remember this is where we're going to form an alkoxide, and it'll it'll do an SN two reaction on um, an alkyl halide. Um, in the case of the epoxide formation, um, we're basically going to use a, a one two um, hydrohalon. Okay, so if you remember back, if you treat um, an alkene um, with a halogenating agent in the presence of water, um, rather than adding both halogens across the alkene, um, you will uh, form the halonium uh, ion, and that'll actually be displaced or, or opened with water. So for example, if I do Br2 in water, okay, what I'll do is I'll add Br2 and water across that olefin, and that goes with the anti-stereochemistry, okay? But now at this point, um, if I just treat this with some base, and in this case, it doesn't have to be full-on sodium hydride, we can just um, use something that's um, only just going to uh, mildly deprotonate, 
Um, so something even like sodium hydroxide will do the job. And this will actually um, force this to close down uh, and form our epoxide, right? And so you can see the stereochemistry there um, where that oxygen will remain back in both cases, okay? So uh, there we formed our epoxide and then the byproducts would be H2O and HBr in this case. Okay, just to be a little bit more explicit about the mechanism, and I can draw out just a little bit of the, uh, the substituents here. So here we have our hydroxyl and right next to it is that carbon X bond, whether that's bromide or chloride or what have you. Okay, and so we're going to treat this with a base uh, and so we're going to generate some amount um, of the, uh, the corresponding alkoxide, right? So O minus, and there's our, our X, okay? And we don't need much of this uh, because um, since these are right next to each other, um, there's not a huge entropic penalty for this reaction to occur. So um, that's why we don't need to fully form a, you know, the, the full alkoxide. But as soon as we form some of this, um, as long as that CX bond can be anti-periplanar to the oxygen, right? So planar, but anti, um, what you can do is it intramolecular backside attack on that carbon halogen. So that leaves, and then um, what we're going to get out is then the epoxide, okay? So, And there's our epoxide, okay? So, so that's just an intramolecular SN2 reaction and it happens um, on adjacent carbons. And so keep in mind, as with any SN2, um, with that backside displacement, we're going to invert the stereochemistry of that carbon, right? So that's going to be an inversion uh, of stereochemistry. Now, the important thing to keep in mind is that this requires um, the ability of O and X to get into an anti-periplanar conformation. So in the case of um, a cyclic uh, halohydrin. So for example, if I have this stereochemistry, right? Yes, can this, can this form uh, the epoxide, right? And the answer is no, because the, this carbon bromine bond has no way to get itself into a, an anti-periplanar conformation. Um, relative to that hydroxyl group. So, so that is a case where you simply can't form an epoxide um, by an SN2 uh, type of reaction, okay? Um, and uh, just to follow up on that, um, the stereochemistry, um, due to this anti-periplanar um, requirement, the stereochemistry of the starting halohydrin will dictate the stereochemistry of the product. And so let me just show you um, two cases where this is illustrated. So in an acyclic case, um, you know, this of course can, can just orient itself until it gets into the anti-periplanar um, orientation. But the, uh, the relative position of, of those substituents is going to be um, impacted by that. So in the case of this starting material, the product of the epoxide formation will have both methyl groups sin to one another Okay. And if we went in with the diastereomer of that halohydrin, right, where now the bromine is back, same reaction conditions, right? In order to get to the same anti-periplanar uh, conformation, um, that's going to require uh, a different orientation of the two methyl groups. So in this case, now the methyls will be opposite one another, okay? And we will get to that uh, opposite stereochemistry um, of the of the epoxide. Okay, so stereochemistry is very important, uh, of course, um, for uh, SN2 types of reactions. Okay, in the next video, we'll go through a little bit of the chemistry that epoxides can undergo and find out why they are so useful.